So why talk about end-of-life decisions? Um, it's not always the most comfortable topic to talk about. And it, I think for most people, um, it comes at different times of their life when they're ready to talk about it. Uh, but we know that there's little or no communication with families about plans for um, after their lifetime. So this is a really great first start for you to come in and um, learn a little bit more about that today. Um, plans get put off and never get done. So that can be a problem for those you leave behind. So we're here to try and guide you through that. The result is someone else will be making those critical decisions for you. Um, the lack of quality of information makes us fearful and apprehensive about death and dying. With the right information on the subject, you actually talk about these issues with your family while you're still with us, and your wishes are known and your intent can be followed. Bring calm and peace at a critical time, because that's when um, it can be very difficult for the, those we leave behind. And then family can focus more on family and the grieving process. So at this time, I would like to introduce, well, first of all, can I just say a huge thank you to Father Akoli and the staff here, Philip and Amy and all the staff at All Saints. They have made us feel so welcome and they've been a complete um, partner in getting us set up here today. We're so very fortunate and thank you all, um, the staff at All Saints for all your work in making this happen for us today. <laughs> and now I'd like to introduce you to Father Jabita Akoli, um, who is going to talk us through the pastoral care of the sick and dying. Thank you so much. Good morning. And I want to welcome you to All Saints. Uh, we have been doing our best to make sure we open our doors for any group that would, in one way or the other, help people in so many ways of life, no matter what it is. So this is one of those opportunities that we have been trying to create to make people come in and be able to be educated on so many things about life. So I want to thank the Catholic Foundation for asking us to open our doors. And uh, just be sure that if you still need our help anytime, all sense will be open to that. And with that said, I don't know if I'm really qualified to talk about this, because it gets scary a little bit. There are two priests from Nigeria who wrote two books. The very first one wrote a book titled, Ready to Die. And then the second person, after reading Ready to Die, felt very uncomfortable that this guy was talking about death. And he wrote, more or, more or less, a counter to that. Not a counter in terms of both of them conflicting, but trying to give people more hope. And he wrote, ready to leave. <laughs> and then, after just a few years, the guy that wrote, ready to leave, died in a car accident. <laughs> and then the guy that wrote, ready to die, lived up to his 80s. He died a few years ago. But then that's the irony of life. We are born to die. The very moment we are born, we are already getting ourselves ready to die because death is inevitable. And the more prepared we are, spiritually and physically, the better for us. So that's why a discussion like this one is really very important because it draws us back to reality. Nobody is going to live forever. Everybody is going to die. Do I know when? I don't. And you do not either. But all of us will die. So, talking about the pastoral care of the sick and dying, I think taking care of the sick is one of those activities that every Catholic priest does that gives us a whole lot of joy. Going through my priestly life, I'm getting into 27 years of my priestly life, it has been a thing of joy when I walk into hospital rooms or people's homes and then pray with the sick one, anoint the sick one, and many a time you see a wide smile in the face of that sick one 
And he or she turns around and says, Father, thank you so much. Or you hear the family members turn around and say to you, Father, thank you so much. You kind of get a whole lot of fulfillment because you feel that you have given a little bit of life back to that individual and to the family members. Many a time, the unexpected do happen. A couple of times I have walked into homes and the person was not really conscious. But then the very moment you begin the prayer, you see the eyes of that person wide open. And sometimes the person ends up by saying amen when you conclude the prayer. And the family members will be like, what really happened? This person had not talked for two or three days. What changed? Miracles do happen. God can do anything. God can change anything. And that is why anointing of the sick is something that is very important in the life of every Christian, more especially in the life of every Catholic. So I'm going to draw my discussion this morning from the three most important books that the church uses. Talk about the Bible. That's our number one manual. The Catechism of the Catholic Church. And then the documents of the Second Vatican Council. I will draw some of my thoughts from these very important books. And talking about uh, the Second Vatican Council by way of introduction, the document on the, I mean, the decree on the ministry and life of priests, that's Presbyterium Ordinis, in number five made it very clear that by anointing of the sick, the priest relieve those who are ill. They bring relief to those who are ill. And like I said, that relief does not just go to the people who are ill. Many a time, the relief also goes to the family members because you hear the family members tell you, this is something our mom or our dad really desired. And we are so happy because we are able to get you as a priest to be able to fulfill this. Father, we are so grateful and we are highly relieved that we gave our mom or our dad this wonderful gift. It brings that relief. And how does it bring it and why does it bring it? It goes to the fact that anointing of the sick is one of the seven sacraments of the church. I'm sure many of us are old school, so many of us, I mean, read the Baltim or Catechism. And you ask yourself, what is a sacrament? We define it in the Baltim or Catechism as external sign of inward grace. That's sacrament. External sign of inward grace, outward sign of inward grace, instituted by Jesus Christ himself through which grace is poured into our souls. That's what sacrament is all about. Outward sign of inward grace, instituted by Jesus himself, through which grace is poured into our souls. And in the church, we have these seven sacraments. So the Catechism of the church tells us that the church believes and confesses that among the seven sacraments, there is one especially intended to strengthen those who are being tried by illness. And what is that one? The anointing of the sick. So the anointing of the sick is a source of grace. It's not just a physical thing that a priest comes into the room and performs. It is a source of grace, like the Holy Eucharist. The priest acting in persona Christi in the person of Jesus Christ does the external signs. But then the inward grace is what is poured into that soul by Jesus Christ himself, not by the priest, even though the priest is acting 
in the name of Jesus and also representing the church at that point in time. So he performs the external acts, but then the grace that comes from the sacrament is what Jesus Christ does. So that's why anointing of the sick is one of those sacraments, is one of those sources of grace. And that is why, I mean, even the Baltimore Catechism will tell you that we should always desire to receive the sacraments because the sacraments are sources of grace. So every Catholic should always have the desire to receive the sacraments. So there should be always that desire to receive anointing of the sick because it is one of the sacraments. And being one of the sacraments, like I said, is a source of grace. And the grace that comes from the sacrament of, I mean, anointing of the sick is so much more in the sense that it becomes a source of healing. Among the seven sacraments, we have two sacraments of healing. Number one of them is the sacrament of reconciliation. When we go to confession, what do we do? We pour out our sins to a priest who behind the confession now is, is uh, another Christ representing God and also representing the church. So you pour out your sins and the priest gives you absolution, cleaning you of your sins and restoring you to good health and then bringing you back to the community whom you have offended. So the sacrament of reconciliation is a sacrament of healing. And then the sacrament of anointing of the sick is also a sacrament of healing. It brings healing to the soul. But not only is the soul, it also brings healing to the body. If God wills, remember, every prayer that we say ends with, may your will be, may your will be, for every good Christian, that's the conclusion of every prayer that we say. Let the will of God be done. Not my will, like Jesus did. It wasn't his will. It was the will of the Father. Father, if it is your will, let this cup pass by. Not my will, but your will be done. And that's exactly what happens, too, in the sacrament of anointing. Whereas it brings healing to the soul, it also brings healing to the body, if that is the will of the Father. And I wouldn't lie to you, because there have been so many instances, too, in all my years as a Catholic priest, that after anointing the sick, I walked out of the room. After a few minutes or a few hours, I received a phone call. Father, my mom seems to have gotten back to her life. Everything has changed, Father. And I would be like, really? Yes, Father. What did you do? I did nothing. <laughs> I just did the anointing. Who did the work? Jesus himself. So if it is the will of Jesus, the physical healing happens. And don't get me wrong. There has been times when I received call, Father, after 30 minutes that you left the room, my mom passed on. But she passed on very peacefully. Father, it's like she was waiting for you to come. And once you did the anointing, she was ready to go. So we do receive those calls. But remember, one of the reasons for anointing of the sick is to bring healing to the soul of the individual, to strengthen that person who is at the point of death, to strengthen that person who is struggling with illness, to bring peace of mind to that person who is struggling at that very moment. It does that, not by the power of the priest, but by the power of God, whom the priest at that very moment is representing. And it also gives that individual the courage to be able to fight on. That's what the sacrament does for somebody who is sick. And when you look back in the scripture, 
you saw it very clear that the authority and the power to bring this healing was given by Jesus Christ himself. When you read the Bible, Matthew chapter 10, I think from verse 5, it tells you the story of how Jesus Christ sent out his 12 apostles, the very first missionaries that he sent out. What did he ask them to do? To heal the sick to cast out those who were uh, possessed by demons, to raise the dead. He gave them that power. He gave them that authority to go out and do that. And they went. They did it. They were successful. And when they got back, they were so happy with what they were able to accomplish. And they knew and recognized that it was not them. It was Jesus who had the authority it was Jesus who had the power, but it was Jesus who gave them that power and the authority to be able to do that. It was done more than 2,000 years ago. The same Jesus continues to do it in our own time. If we have faith, if we believe in him, if we trust in him, he continues to do it in our own time. And that is why the priest who does it doesn't do it in his name. He does it in the name of Jesus, by the authority given to him by Jesus to heal the sick, to cast out demons, to raise the dead. It still happens in our own time. Joined to anointing of the sick is also what is called viaticum. Viaticum means the food of those on a journey. And the church offers those who are about to live this life the Eucharist. That's why sometimes you see the Eucharist being described as viaticum, the food of those who are on a journey. A friend of mine was getting ready to go on a mountain climbing. He's an older priest. I was a young priest, then I'm no longer a young priest, now I'm an old priest. So when I was still a young priest, this older gentleman was preparing to go on a mountain climbing. He's a very good friend of mine. He, he was so excited about what he was going to do. He got himself prepared, got everything ready, got a whole lot of water and other kind of stuff. But then, midway through going to the mountain, what happened? he found out he couldn't go further with all the things he strapped around himself. <laughs> he started taking them off one after the other. He knew the weight was really so much on him, and he couldn't continue without taking so many of those stuff out of his body. And he realized that the only thing he really needed at that point in time was food that would give him energy a little bit of energy food. That was what he needed, and some water too. All every other thing he had was a waste. And that's what happens in our journey. Because we are men and women who are on a pilgrimage. We are pilgrims. We are climbing a mountain. Remember how Prophet Isaiah des described it. On this mountain, the Lord prepared a very big banquet for people like you and me on this mountain. So we are going on top of the mountain to behold that banquet that God has prepared for us. And if we're going to get to the top of the mountain, we must be ready. We must have the energy. We must have the strength to be able to make it to the top of the mountain. And what is it that should help us get to the top of that mountain? It is the Holy Eucharist. That's why it is called the food of pilgrims, the food of those who are on their way, on the journey to the top of the mountain. It brings strength to them, to all of us, so that whenever we approach the Eucharist, we are getting the source of our strength. We are getting the energy to continue to march on to be able to get to the top of that mountain. And that's one good thing one of the very best things that Jesus Christ did for us, leaving behind his body and his blood as a source of life for all of us. 
So imagine what it does for somebody who was at the point of death. Imagine what it does for somebody who is struggling with some kind of illness. Imagine the relief it brings to that person. It gives that person a whole lot of strength. And that is why the fathers of the Second Vatican Council, writing on the document on the sacred liturgy, the, I mean the Constitution on the sacred liturgy, number 39, they stated that a special sign of participation in the mystery celebrated in the Mass, describing viaticum, this food that is given to the dying, that it is a special sign of participation in the mystery celebrated in the Mass. That makes that person participate in what we do in the church every day. That reminds that individual that he or she is part of the community and that he or she shares in that mystery that we celebrate all the time. And that's the mystery of the death of our Lord and his passage to the Father. Strengthened by the body of Christ, the Christian is endowed with the pledge of the resurrection in his passage from this life. Like I said, it's from the decree on sacred liturgy, number 39. It's a sign of participation in the resurrection of Jesus. So that is why it is very important that at that moment, that individual is struggling especially if that individual is still able to receive the body of Christ, viaticum must also be administered so that the person empowered by Jesus in the Holy Eucharist will have the courage and the strength to fight on and will be able to enjoy in that resurrection which Jesus Christ has given to us. And so... That takes us to some questions about when do we receive the anointing of the sick and even the viaticum? When do we receive these? I have walked into rooms. Some people have called and said, Father Jovita, can you come and pray for my mom or my dad? And I walk into the room, I start praying, and at a point in time I stop and ask, can I anoint your mom? And the answer would be, Father, no, it's not yet time. (laughs) It's not yet time. I'm like, I didn't come with the oil of death. (laughs) I came into your room with oil of life. (laughs) But we do get this question, I mean, get this answer many a time when we ask, can I administer the oil of anointing? And people are scared about it. They turn around to say, Father, not yet. And I'm like, when, if not now? So it takes me time to explain to the family members that no time is late and no time is too early. You can always receive the sacrament of anointing whenever you are sick. And receiving the sacrament of anointing doesn't mean that the priest is administering the oil of death. The priest is actually administering the oil of healing. The priest is trying, by virtue of anointing, to bring you back to life, your spiritual life and your physical life. So he is not condemning you to death. He is actually helping to raise you to life. So as soon as possible, as soon as you find out that somebody is sick, as soon as you find out that somebody has been maybe diagnosed of having cancer, diabetes, or some of those are terminal sicknesses or diseases, that's the right time to call a priest and say, can you come over and celebrate the sacrament of anointing of the sick for this person? And don't get me wrong. Going back... When you talk about the different names that this sacrament had gone through, you wouldn't blame people when they are scared. Like I said, if you did this uh, catechism, Baltimore catechism, it called it what? Extreme unction, 
which is to the end. <laughs> and then he changed again, last rite. What is last rite? Oh, it's at the point of death. But then the Vatican II Council Fathers also made it very clear when they said, extreme unction, which may also and more fittingly be called anointing of the sick. It's not a sacrament of those who are at the point of death. Hence, as soon as any one of the faithful begins to be in danger of death from sickness or old age, the fitting time for him to receive this sacrament has certainly arrived. You can find this again in the Constitution on, on Sacred Liturgy, number 73. So don't wait until the last minute. Call a priest whenever somebody is sick, whenever somebody is getting ready for surgery, and whenever somebody is actively dying, that's the time to invite a priest. Don't wait, especially for somebody who is going to receive the Holy Eucharist. Call the priest when that person is still very conscious and when that person st will still be able to consume the sacred species. That's the time to call a priest. Don't wait. And so, I'm going to leave you at this point. If you have any questions, I mean, anything that needs some more clarifications, I think I still have about nine minutes to attend to that. And then we have some other resources as listed on the screen. The Catechism of the Catholic Church from number 1499 to 1532. You can also check the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, uh, the letter of St. James, chapter 5. Uh, and in our website, allsensedollars.org slash anointing, and then usccb.org. You can get more information on anointing of the sick from these uh, resources. So I'm going to take the next eight minutes if you have any questions. Thank you. Okay. I think I know the answer, but how many times can you do it? I mean, there's some sacraments you can only do once. Okay. I don't think this is one of them. Okay. You have a maximum amount of time. Okay. <laughs> The question is, how many times can we do anointing? There are some sacraments that you can only receive twice. I mean, once. Those sacraments are the sacraments that put an indelible marks on our souls that you cannot repeat those sacraments. One good example is baptism. You can't be baptized twice. But anointing of the sick is not one of those sacraments. Anointing of the sick is one of the sacraments you can receive as often as necessary. One thing you try to avoid is to abuse the sacrament. Just the moment you know that you are not abusing the sacrament, you can always receive the sacrament of anointing. It doesn't say you receive it once in a lifetime or twice in a lifetime. You can receive it as many times as necessary, provided you are not abusing it. Okay. Any other question? Okay, when I say abuse, I mean... Could you repeat the question, please? Okay, he said, when I say abuse, what do I really mean? Abuse means the same thing abuse means in every other thing. Okay, for example, I have headache today, and I call the priest to come in and anoint me, and the priest walks in, prays, and anoints me because I have headache, and then... I feel, okay, the effect of the anointing has already waned out. I'm going to call another priest tomorrow to walk in and do the same anointing because I believe that the more I am anointed, the more I get healed. So that's one of the ways we can really abuse the sacrament. You trust in the grace of God and you trust that once you are anointed at that point in time, that the effect of the sacrament is going to be effective on your soul and on your body. So you don't just like, I want to keep pushing doing it because this or that. No. So that's kind of abuse. And another way of abuse is there are some people who don't even believe in the efficacy of the sacrament. So they are just doing it for the sake of doing it without any faith, without any belief. 
It doesn't take away, I mean, uh, the efficacy of the sacrament, but then what about the individual? But one thing I keep telling people, and I want to point it out, abuse does not destroy use. Okay? Abuse does not destroy use. So even when you think that the person is abusing it, I'm not going to uh, say, I'm not going to anoint you. I know the use of anointing of the sick, and I'm still going to do it because even though you are abusing it, it is not taking away the usefulness of the sacrament. So the church steps in, and the church does what is right at any given time. Okay. Oh, sorry. In case the priest is not available for some reason, can we get, for example, the deacon to come and do anointing and the viaticum? Okay. That's uh, one of the sacraments that the church resolves only to ordain the priest. The deacon can come in and pray for the person who is dying, and the deacon can also come in and uh, give communion to the dying person, which uh, some lay faithful do. They can go in, pray for that person, and administer the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist. That's right. But when it comes to sacrament of anointing, it is one of those sacraments that only priests can administer. So it is reserved to Catholics, um, to Catholic priests. Is anointing of the sick as effective as the Eucharist in healing your soul? Okay, that's a very difficult question <laughs> because, I mean, we know what the Eucharist is in the life of the church. That's the center and the summit of our Christian faith, of our Christian practice. So when you begin to compare any sacrament with the Holy Eucharist, you kind of get into some kind of trouble because... What is the church without the Holy Eucharist? Everything the church does, every of the other sacraments, all of them revolve around the Holy Eucharist. The Holy Eucharist is that which holds everything in the church together. So you cannot, there is no comparison between the Holy Eucharist and any other sacrament, especially when you realize, which unfortunately, great percentage of Catholics do not believe this or do not realize it. There is real presence of Jesus in the Holy Eucharist, whether you believe it or not. It's a fact, and that's the truth. Jesus is real in the Holy Eucharist, and there is nothing better and there is nothing greater than receiving Jesus into my life, body and soul, in all his divinity, allowing him to take possession of me in the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist. That's the highest gift that God gave to mankind, that we, unworthy though we are, that we can eat the body and drink the blood of Jesus Christ. So if you are talking about comparison, the Eucharist remains the summit of our Christian faith and our Christian liturgy, our Christian practice. Nothing compares to the Holy Eucharist. Okay. Any other question? Are you going to let me? Okay. <laughs> Okay. Uh, what is what if a person's in mortal sin? How is it effective? How effective is the sacrament of the sin? Okay. Thank you for that question. She is asking if somebody is in a state of mortal sin, part of the anointing of the sick, and why the deacons and the lay faithful can't do that sacrament is that it comes with sacrament of reconciliation. It comes with forgiveness of sins. That's part of it. And if the person is not conscious enough to be able to go to confession, there is what is called apostolic blessing. In that apostolic blessing, the priest gives absolution to that individual, even though the individual is not conscious. But then his or her sins are forgiven based on that apostolic blessing that the priest imposes on that person. So the sacrament of anointing of the sick 
comes with reconciliation. So even if that person is in a state of mortal sin, he or she has the chance to reconcile at that very moment. If he cannot do it consciously, there is what is called ecclesia suplet. The church supplies with the apostolic blessing, and that helps the individual at that point in time. Well, that makes me feel a lot better. Okay. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Um, I was just curious about kind of the definition of sick. So specifically with pregnancy, um, I would assume that you could get an anointing of the sick before, say, a C-section, because that is a surgery. But you don't always know that you're going to have a C-section until you are literally being taken away. So could you potentially get an anointing of the sick right before you go into the labor, um, just kind of in anticipation? Okay, if you go back to the last slide. Oh. Okay. When to receive is very clear there. The number three, before surgery. And labor is part of it. When a woman is going to go into labor, it's advisable that you call a priest to come and anoint that person. When somebody is preparing for any surgery, I mean, thanks to parishioners of all saints, many of them approach us after mass and say, I'm going to get surgery tomorrow. Father, can you anoint me? Which is a very good plus because it really means that you do understand what it means to get anointing. So you can get it when you are preparing for surgery. You can get it when, as a, as a pregnant woman, you are about to get into labor. You can get, I mean, if I'm going to go to hospital, for example, when I went to do my clonoscopy, I had to ask a priest friend of mine, can you anoint me? Because I don't know what is going to happen after that. I'm going into a situation where I will lose my consciousness. Supposing I don't get up from there, that will be the end. So I have to go and ask a priest, please anoint me as I go into this procedure. It doesn't cost anything, and it doesn't take anything away. Actually, you gain the grace of the sacrament when you ask for it and when you get it. Yes. Okay. And he's dying. We do not receive, uh, refuse any person the sacrament. In the procedure for anointing of the sick, if that person is in that uh, situation you are talking about, there are some that we have to ask them just the same questions we do ask, maybe I think on Holy Saturday night. Do you believe in God? Do you believe in the, uh, I, I mean, in, the, in the teachings of the Catholic Church? Do you believe, we just kind of repeat all those questions. If the answer coming from that person is yes, then the person receives the anointing. But then again, um, what's the canon again? I think it's canon 1752. The last canon in the Code of Canon Law. It tells you that the highest of all the laws of the church is salvation of soul. That's the highest law. So in danger of death, many of the laws are kind of taken aside to save the soul. I don't know if what I'm saying makes sense. The highest law is salvation of soul. So what that means is that when somebody is in danger of death, there are so many laws that are not really kind of concentrated on. Your whole goal at that moment is to save that person's soul. So that applies to somebody who is in that situation. The priest, in his own judgment, realizing what that person is going through at that moment, in his consciousness would be, I want to save a soul. And in the process of saving that soul, the priest can give that anointing to make sure that that soul is saved. Because Jesus came that all, no exclusion. He came that everyone would have life and have the abundance of life. He came to save all of us. So that applies in that particular situation. Okay. So once again, I want to thank you all for giving me this opportunity. And uh, I will try to make myself available after 2 p.m., in case you still have some personal questions, if you can't get at me today, 
uh, my email address is always open in All Saints Catholic uh, uh, Parish uh, website. You can always email me or you can always make a phone call if you need more clarifications on this, and I will be able to help address your concerns or answer your questions. So once again, thank you to the Catholic Foundation for giving me this opportunity. God bless you.